again, this talk is um, Rebels, it's called Rebel Cities Talks, a global network of uh, neighborhoods and cities rejecting surveillance. Um, your speaker is Renata Avila. Uh, she's a human rights lawyer. She represented Julian Assange and WikiLeaks uh, and is a board member of the Creative Commons and chairperson of Creative Commons Guatemala. And um, here at the Congress also to find some people who would like to get involved with the Courage Foundation campaign. So if that's one of your things, go find it later. Um, and for now, enjoy the talk. Well, uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. Um, it is a humbling experience to be on this side because I'm usually in that, on that side. And now I know what my mother, who was uh, one, one of the four uh, women in engineering school, uh, felt in the classroom every day. <laughs> but it is not intimidating at all, actually. It is, um, it is challenging because I know that most of you know far more about technology and its uses, but I know that I can contribute something uh, to you today, and I hope I can contribute uh, something uh, to uh, this challenging conversation around cities, and I really, really hope that you will leave this room with a long list of to-dos that you can do locally uh, in order to challenge uh, surveillance. So, uh, the proposal of this talk uh, was inspired uh, because I, uh, there's um, an increased... Um, uh, paranoia on me. Um, I used to, I mean, um, I was surprised when I started to spend more time in Europe instead of in Latin America on how used to uh, oppressive surveillance technologies Latin Americans are, uh, me included. Um, constantly, like uh, the typical day for a Latin American, it involves so many checkpoints, points of control, and things that we, we simply got used to it. Uh, for example, to enter a building, you will uh, have to show your uh, ID like twice to private uh, security officers. Uh, you, will have, uh, you will have your ID, ID that is a biometric ID, scanned and stored somewhere. Most of the countries do not have even data protection laws, and so on. So, uh, basically, um, also another another layer of worry uh, started to bother me, and that was uh, the increased uh, protection on trade secrets. And if we saw the talk before uh, with uh, Mr. Harvey, uh, I mean, it is getting uh, more and more complex. Uh, these sophisticated systems of commercial surveillance to set us, sell us and stuff. And at the same time, it is getting more and more challenging to even know how these systems are built. Uh, Europe passed uh, this year the new trade secrets directive, and uh, that will likely be exported everywhere. So uh, this, the scrutiny that citizens can uh, exercise is getting limited. And also nets of corruption. I mean, this year was especially interesting to understand, and I think that, uh, again, Latin Americans, we are more used to this uh, sophisticated, uh, connected uh, networks of corrupted people, corrupting uh, elections, corrupting many, many other things, media. Uh, but I think that this year and the election of Donald Trump and, and many other things that happened uh, show that it, the uh, rich um, so-called democratic countries are not immune to, uh, to that. And it is there, it, it was just not as visible. So, but, so I started, okay, uh, activism is great, but I have been working on, on uh, grassroots digital activism for the three years and it's, nothing is really happening. And so I, I am a positive, I'm a very positive person, so I, I decided instead of looking at what wasn't working, to look at examples that, of communities and networks that where uh, their activism is working, uh, even with uh, little resources and with very high opponents. So I found the inspiration at home. Um, at home, um, and that's uh, long before uh, Standing Rock uh, situation in the US, indigenous people, uh, because of uh, uh, um, a legal frame, an uh, international legal frame uh, on, in, on the right uh, of indigenous people to be consulted in um, uh, projects that affect them and impact uh, 
their territories and the place they live. Uh, they have the right, uh, they have been exercising uh, community process of, of, of uh, either accepting or rejecting mining projects, fracking projects, and any project that might uh, affect the, the place where they live. They were like the, the first hint of inspiration for me to prepare this talk because, I mean, they, most of the indigenous communities doing this uh, live below the poverty line. Most of the indigenous communities are doing these exercises and rejecting uh, things that will uh, bring to their communities relative uh, wealth, economic wealth, but will damage the rest, uh, are doing uh, very courageous, constant exercises of democracy and defeating uh, very powerful multinationals uh, by uh, getting like uh, active. <laughs> Uh, but that's not new, and that, that's, that's happening more and more and more. It's, it's very invisible because, of course, your press will not report it. And, of course, they are under great threat. My second inspiration was what happened, and is happening in Europe, and it's very exciting. It's like really radical majors that care, uh, uh, that place a public interest above uh, uh, financial gain are getting elected. And it is amazing how, how we, we, we have been tricked. I think we have been tricked uh, to believe that you cannot, that government is bad, that you, you, can, you shouldn't get involved in politics and you cannot change anything. In fact, you can change a lot if you are, if you are uh, in, inside power. And in Spain, it's, it's, it's an interesting example because uh, um, uh, two uh, radical mayors got elected in the most important cities of Madrid and Barcelona. And one of the first policies that the mayor of Madrid did was re policy of refugees welcome. Even, even if her government, her central government is saying like, no, 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 uh, we don't want refugees in Spain and they're very racist and so on. Uh, opening the doors of the city uh, of, of Madrid uh, to those coming and, and dedicating and allocating public funds to that, uh, it is a big step. So, uh, and I, bear with me, I'm getting closer to our issues. The next thing, and that was super exciting, is like, okay, a city can do a lot, but a network of cities can send a powerful message uh, to those, uh, to those on the other side, trying to control us and to manipulate us. And, and that was um, the, the third example, which uh, hinted me at uh, the power of cities uh, to, and neighborhoods to, do, to change things, is uh, the free TTIP uh, zones. 60 municipalities in Europe uh, declared themselves as uh, cities uh, like challenging the, the TTIP. And I think that 60 municipalities, if you, if you combine all the services that they uh, purchase, all the policies that they, they influence, and the constituency that they have behind, it is a very powerful political force. Uh, it is uh, all together, it, it, I mean the population of those cities, the most, of the, the most populated cities of Europe, uh, can, can really shift an election uh, uh, at, that, at, at, at some point. Then, that's my other inspiration. Uh, she's Nerida Cifuentes. She is a parliamentarian from Bolivia, and she is my age. I, when I, li I read the list of achievements of Nerida and my tiny, my tiny list of achievements, I feel like, a, a, like really, 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 uh, I have done nothing with my life. Uh, she's, uh, she's a community leader and radio activist. Um, and she got elected to the assembly uh, in Bolivia, an indigenous woman. Imagine all the barriers that she had to defeat. And she became free software activist. I, I know that we haven't heard so much of, of, of this kind of activism, but again, it's the things that don't, don't get reported so much. And as part of the amazing work, work that Nerida has done and on, uh, on the local air, uh, is to design uh, a complete fl uh, a whole uh, framework uh, for free software, free hardware, and digital sovereignty. And what is very interesting is, okay, it might, it might be super impractical, it might be like really difficult to implement in Bolivia, but what, it, what is really important for me is uh, that uh, she departed from 
what she experienced uh, of colonization, of oppression, of exclusion, of racism. So all the frames that she developed are designed from the local realities and trying to affect local policies. And if, uh, uh, if in Bolivia, uh, someone who only adopted like late in life technology is thinking about that, why, why we are not thinking on more proactive, uh, positive agendas around our issues? And my last inspiration was, uh, of course, the mayor of Barcelona, Ada Colau. Uh, she got elected uh, last year, and one of the first things that she did was to in invite a bunch of uh, digital rights organizations to uh, her office. And in her office, instead of uh, having, you know, like uh, diplomas and things about herself, uh, what she had uh, in her desk was uh, um, the picture of the first anarchist woman uh, who got into power in Spain, the first minister, I think it was of health. And it was a very interesting experience because she didn't know anything about our topics, technology, surveillance, and all of that. But she opened the door and, and because she, come, uh, she comes from social movements, so she, she was this welcoming authority that was willing to listen. And that really started a process to re renovating uh, and examining and, and taking a critical approach on what, uh, what kind of technology was, uh, was purchased. And, and then, getting closer to the topics, uh, ACLU uh, connected also a network of cities uh, to challenge uh, police surveillance and the kind of uh, technology that police was uh, uh, getting uh, in order to monitor citizens. Well, that got me back uh, to, uh, to my, my, my local neighborhood because uh, bad policy is contagious. Not only courage is contagious, bad policy too. And ba uh, bad public policy, uh, when money is involved, it really gets, it, it is spreads quickly, especially when the asymmetry of the knowledge of uh, those who take the decisions in public office and those outside convincing them uh, and with a big stake making a big profit on it, uh, uh, it, it is huge. Um, municipalities in, in, in Latin America, in many countries, in, like, even here, municipalities and the people uh, buying the things, they do not have a very sophisticated knowledge on what they are acquiring. And, and usually vendors of surveillance technologies and vendors of control technologies and even vendors of these fake uh, technologies to improve bad neighborhoods and so on, uh, arrive with very shiny videos and uh, brochures trying to convince them that it is good and they will get results and they will, they, 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 it, will, it will be good for the city to ad adopt this technology. Um, and technology, like uh, adopting a technological solution usually um, sounds good when you are trying to sell, uh, to, to sell your political project. Uh, usually in, the, in, in each and every government plan nowadays, you, you hear the, uh, the mention of technology, technology, technology to improve our lives. And smart cities, of course, but I, I do not even want to get into the smart cities issue. Um, I want just to state in, in this, uh, in this um, imbalance in, in the power of those uh, taking those decisions. So, uh, the thing is, um, and I, I wanted to make that very clear, that when, when, when a city and when a space, when a neighborhood embraces uh, surveillance technologies, we are sacrificing more than just privacy. Uh, and I think that we have failed uh, in the activism to, uh, to, to quantify what we are losing, not only in terms of rights, but also in terms of what you can do instead with the money and the resources that uh, we are investing in, in, in all the surveillance technology and all the uh, sensors around us in the cities. And that, that could be like... A, a, like better parks, better libraries, better better uh, public spaces for youth at risk, and by f like the benefits of, of these kind of places are uh, like bigger. But we are also sacrificing uh, the right to protest. So basically, uh, this surveillance populism is. Uh, Lots of lights and empty promises. I, I quote my city as an example. Uh, first, we, did, we had open doors. 
Then uh, all the uh, doors were secured. Then uh, cables, electrified cables, would put around the houses. And then a little camera was installed. Then you needed a guard per every every four blocks. And 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 so uh, we live more and more and more trapped into that, and less and less secure. Sixteen uh, in just in my city, there are sixteen murders per day. So it is it is obviously not working. And. Uh, every year, the municipalities get uh, these vendors and, and usually even international aid, uh, pushing them to install cameras everywhere, pushing them to measure and to tag uh, uh, certain uh, certain behaviors and to monitor specifically certain neighborhoods that are usually those uh, the poorest and those needing other kind of intervention. So. I um, move into the practical aspects. So I, I want to uh, explain basically what I'm proposing, and I would like to hear from you uh, whether it sounds right. And uh, ideally, I would like to move and dedicate my 2017 in developing this positive agenda and this series of guidelines on when we have an ally in power, or when we have uh, the opportunity to uh, participate and intervene in the local decisions on how to get rid of the problem. And, and if we are lucky enough, and if uh, we have a supportive local government uh, elected, the first uh, step that I suggest in this frame of uh, rebel na uh, neighborhoods and cities uh, against surveillance is to make an inventory of all the surveillance that has been like installed over the last five years. And to look into the, into the kind of uh, contracts, have the cost and efficiency of the surveillance installed, and if it's not working, and or if it's not even data available of that, get rid of that. If we, if a, a person in 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 a position of power is able to decide, get rid of this system. It is important to it is important to make it one of the first interventions in in the government, exposing to the to the city how it it is a waste of time and money. The other thing. <laughs> Uh, the other thing that um, we can also dismantle the surveillance systems in our neighborhoods and buildings. I don't know, many more and more we live in privatized spaces uh, governed by the dictatorship of the administrator. I don't know if that happens to you, but I, I am living for a while in Belgrade, and I don't, know, don't understand Cyrillic, so it was a, there was a notice in my building saying, I didn't. I couldn't read, and it was uh, inviting all the all the tenants to come because they wanted to install a camera. I missed the meeting. I I really regret that I couldn't read Cyrillic and, and I missed the meeting because I came back from a travel and there was a big camera installed in front in front of my door. And and sometimes like, out of laziness, out of apathy, out of lack of time, we do not participate in this kind of decisions, and then surveillance is deployed in, in private places. And then we do not even question who, who decided that, how much we are paying for it, and how much we are giving away with it, especially when it's for free. Uh, the other thing that I, I, I propose here in this frame, and very quickly, is cities have the ability to regulate a lot. And they, and they regulate like whether you can walk your, your dog here, whether, whether you can plant cactus or uh, whatever here. You, like uh, the space, the public space in a city is heavily regulated, but surprisingly, cities are not regulating this invisible but yet intrusive activities in public space. So I, I am proposing in, in this frame to regulate data collection, to regulate any uh, Wi-Fi service, any uh, any um, free service that is pro provided in within uh, uh, the areas of competence of a city. I I know that uh, many question me, oh, but it is very difficult to enforce. Well, we need to find the right incentives to do that. If uh, for example, uh, music that is played in a place, or whether it is loud or whether it is like too low, uh, it is regulated. Like very, very hard to regulate things. We need to make very, very difficult to these uh, 
as Aral Balkan um, um, uh, calls them, uh, data farmers, uh, the, uh, collecting data of people. We need to make very difficult for them to be able to execute these activities in public spaces, especially in, in places uh, where children go, in places where we want to have a private time away from the cameras. And also cameras that are becoming more and more and more invisible and more like melted in, into the environment. We need to start regulating that. And um, regulating what private actors do too. Uh, more in mo uh, more uh, private security is invading every space, not only uh, public space, but uh, spaces that the general uh, that op open to the public. And and we need to uh, increase, like cities can increase the scrutiny on what they are doing with the data and what the, what these people are actually doing uh, uh, with the monitoring activities. And the third thing is eff efficiency and expenditure. I mean, we need to quantify what we are giving away every time that these systems are deployed. And we also need to point out at those who are wasting public funds uh, deploying systems that are inefficient and that are intrusive. And also encouraging local vendors because more and more, um, and, and that's very important and I will need the help of many of you here is, uh, when a city is going to buy, uh, buy equipment of this kind, uh, usually um, they write the specifications of the equipment and, uh, and the systems based on the brochures that they're getting from the uh, dominant vendors. And at the end, we have the basically Cisco and all other two or three companies selling all these kind of things to all the cities all over the world because they, the others cannot compete in price. Uh, so there's lots to be done and, and lots of proactive things to do to specify uh, what do we want actually in the cities if there's uh, this kind of technologies need to, really need to fulfill a specific uh, mission. Um, like I will not have time to go through this, space regulation, public procurement, and also uh, take up uh, proactive stay, uh, steps to create uh, some shared data commons uh, and research uh, uh, by citizens on things that we actually should monitor, like quality of air, quality of water, and, and quality of, uh, of life. Um, before uh, we open to the questions, because I, I want to get questions and comments, what I wanted to say is, uh, is as well, in cities where there's increased inequality, it's very, very important to be vigilant to the technologies and surveillance technologies to, uh, deployed against those who actually need the most. Uh, in many countries uh, and cities, uh, there's uh, coupons, or uh, aid provided to those uh, on the resource, and often th there are mechanisms to monitor and control the poor, to monitor and control their movements, their consumption, and, and also to deploy even harsher measures to exclude them. And that's happening a lot as well in the uh, and with the collaboration of uh, organizations that like even like the United Nations with the refugees coming to Europe. And that's, uh, that's, uh, it is like, oh, okay, we need to get them registered biometrically, get them tagged, get, give them cards so they can only access internet via our services and then track them, track them, track them. And I, I think that they, it, uh, like, it is, uh, it is not only unethical, but it, it is, it is abusive because they are not in a position of power and they, they cannot act the way we can act. Uh, and exercise their citizen, citizenship because they don't have uh, in order to collaborate. And uh, lastly, like I, I just want to mention how we can move uh, next. Uh, there's many initiatives that you can take part of. I think that uh, the way that the uh, Chaos Computer Club uh, and similar computer clubs can get closer to the local uh, authorities if they are welcoming and get nasty to the local authorities if they are not, if they are abusive and, and deploying yeah, and increasing the surveillance and scrutinize every public decision that is take, that is uh, being taken in this. Um, that, that's the initiative in Barcelona, the uh, Barcelona Initiative of Technolo 
technological sovereignty, and many cities are involved in that, and it needs really a lot of help, especially from technologists, uh, to create positive frames in order to eradicate this uh, pervasive surveillance. Uh, I am a member of uh, the advisory board of DM25, the initiative uh, towards a more democratic Europe, and we are setting up the uh, uh, techno technology task force to invite technologists uh, to help us not only on these aspects, but in general aspects, uh, to have a uh, technology agenda consistent, uh, consistent with democracy. And if you are in a position of power and inside a government and you find a contract of these very sophisticated contracts of surveillance technology, uh, link it to your preferred uh, submission platform and, and make it available because we need a repository and we need to document all the practices of all the municipalities doing these kind of things. And uh, Yes, so questions or anyone? Comments? Thank you, Renato. Uh, if you have questions, please line up behind the microphones here and yeah, just ask your question. Uh, do we have questions from the internet? Seems not so, okay. Um, microphone number one. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Uh, we hear very often that, yeah, why should I care and I have nothing to hide? And I think all, most of, all of us here know that it's not a very productive way to react to mass surveillance. What would be a suggestion to try to reach people that doesn't know that how to try to convince, especially non-technical people, people out of STEM area? What would be your suggestion to show them that this is a really important issue? You know, for me, it's a super good question because uh, usually uh, uh, surveillance is linked to criminal activity and it is linked to, okay, it is just for those doing dodgy things. And the important thing of uh, many of the data collection activities that they take place in public uh, spaces is that it has nothing to do with, uh, with uh, uh, crime prevention. It has everything to do with marketing, with uh, commodification of our behaviors, with us getting excluded from certain services or getting more expensive services, and uh, too often also with uh, mechanisms of social control. So I think that we have to move away from all oh, surveillance and cameras just to uh, activists and dissidents and, and uh, to monitor crime. And, it, it, we have to make it personal and recognize that it's part of a, a system of a sophisticated system of, uh, of manipulation of uh, human behavior that's making our lives not better, but actually more expensive and uh, exclusion and discrimination easier. Thank you. Single angel, question from the internet. So the question is, Empowering locals would mean that they would need to see the importance of having no surveillance. So what should uh, you advise to tell people who are convinced that surveillance is a good thing? I think that uh, quantifying, like uh, making very, very visible, and that's part of uh, what I want to encourage others to join and collaborate with, making visible how inefficient surveillance is, and uh, getting more cases written about local failures of surveillance and how much money goes to waste. And also making uh, visible and visual what we gave away when we spent millions in a system, um, surveillance system that didn't work or that was abused for political purposes and what we we are missing in the city, for example, uh, uh, pl uh, childcare places or parks or libraries, and, and that, uh, that contrast on all the money that goes to waste and all the money that could go for social good, uh, I think it's a good way forward. All right. Uh, yeah. Microphone number two. Hi. Um, hi, Renato. It's more, more of a comment, really, um, but that's okay, I guess, if this space is open. Uh, it just occurred to me that um, maybe to mention what, once upon a time in Mexico City, I was swooped upon by various police cars and they closed off the block. I was walking down about 2 a.m. in the morning and came down and grabbed my bag and insisted on explaining why I had a Wi-Fi router in it, etc. But the, the, the reason why they stopped me was because I had my hoodie up on, on, uh, on my sweatshirt. 
and they told me that they had been watching me on the cameras since four streets back. So maybe there's some uh, value in documenting or opening some kind of uh, method for of documenting these kinds of experiences so that um, we could show what some negative effects are at times. Because it was quite a traumatic experience, you know, and as, as you know, uh, it's dangerous in those kinds of situations when you're alone in the street at night and you have lots of cops around. But Absolutely. Okay. In Mexico, it was very dangerous. That's sweet. <laughs> uh, microphone number five, last question. Hello. Uh, I'd like to know, is there uh, some particular cases that you could uh, give an, uh, anecdotal stories that uh, surveillance was used for marketing purposes? Well, I, I, I can mention some. Um, I... I think that, I mean, I actually, I think that uh, like the kind of surveillance that we have in our browsers uh, all the time that uh, monitors our habits and our, our consum consumption patterns uh, in order to sell us stuff. But I have a, a quick other example on free Wi-Fi. Uh, usually when you have to sign, like when you are in a public space, in a public park, and a company agrees on give you or provide uh, your, uh, your city, your small city of free Wi-Fi in public spaces, there's no, no, no such thing as free Wi-Fi if it's provided by a company. And usually what it does is captures the data of all the people attending a certain, and monitors and quantifies the data of all the people using this service for, for free. And then they, they get it back in, in sophisticated forms of advertising that uh, like benefit at the end uh, consumption of certain kind of products. Yeah. Um, but uh, some per, uh, particular cases of surveillance used in that manner, uh, surveillance uh, deployed by the city? Uh, surveillance deployed by the city is usually when it's in combination, is it in public private? Partnership, but I, I can say, tell the case in my, in Guatemala. But you know, everything happens in Guatemala, so it's it's, it's not the best uh, case. But usually, like what what the municipality was doing is they were selling the data of high-profile people movements that they capture with a camera to blackmail politically. So they will get uh, they will get uh, collect all the, who went to which place at what time the video because all the all the city is covered with cameras, and that was uh, that was um, uh, done with the purpose of uh, politi political blackmail. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, time is up. Are you still available? If people have more questions. Uh, can you, can they still find you essentially? Uh, final. Words? Can, are you still at the conference? If people have more questions. <laughs>